Good morning and welcome back to the Sunday morning edition of the Run Your Mouth podcast. Due to recent feedback from listeners of this program, we've decided to do a more sober episodes on Sunday mornings, where we play light jazz music and talk in a more even-keeled voice in order not to alarm our listeners. Apparently, the tone of voice of this programming, in conjunction with the content about fallen currency, has created some alarm. I'm just kidding. We're going to rant and rave. I don't care if I wake up my neighbors. It might be 9 a.m. Sunday morning, but they, they, they partied last night. They, they went hard at 2 in the morning, so either I'm waking them up real early and, uh, you know, we can fight it out in the hallway later, or um, they're, you know, really passed out. Anyways, let's get into some news. Firstly, I want to thank everybody that emailed me uh, about my plunger problems. It's always interesting interesting to me the topics that I get flooded with emails with, but people were sending me all sorts of emails, mostly about devices out of North Korea that are more disgusting than just shoving your own fist into the toilet, putting it down the drain and pulling out whatever turds might be floating around in there. So I appreciate everybody that emailed me. Let me know that in fact, um, I'm not just willing things into existence, but they actually already are in existence, but they're more disgusting than just having a stinky um, you know, plunger sitting around your restroom. And as long as I'm here issuing retractions from last week's episode, uh, I have to admit I was wrong about Meghan Markle. I, I will admit it. And I did my research. I blew through three full days of what should have been my work week, catching up on 10 seasons of um, uh, Suits. I didn't watch 10 seasons. I think I watched three and then I took Amazon off my computer uh, because, you know, some people cannot <laughs> self-regulate when they're alone in their apartment. But... Here's the thing about Meghan Markle. I was watching that Oprah interview, and I'm like, wow, this is one unlikable lady. But then I realized it's just a bad casting. That's all it is. They've got her fat, pregnant, uh, playing the victim. That's just the wrong thing for her. This lady needs to be skinny, beautiful, um, playing very competent, intelligent, and both confident, but at the same time, a little bit vulnerable and available. That's the right kind of casting. So I think they just, you know... You got to get back to writers. They got to sit back down in the room. They got to realize that this image, it's the wrong thing. Let's stop the spinoff series. She's doing a spinoff series right now where she breaks up the royal family. And I think we just got to close that thing off. Sometimes you got to cut your losses. You just got to realize that the supporting character really couldn't pull off being the main character. Sometimes it works. Sometimes you got a character like a Dwight True kind of guy and you go, wow, this guy's a fan. But then you realize he's only good as a side character. So let's end the branch off season of the whole royal family thing. Didn't quite hit. Just get suits back up and running even though I've got seven seasons to watch so that doesn't really help me in any capacity and I'm done with that show but you know I just wanted to apologize for to to Megan for all those harsh things I said it's just you're unlikable when you're pregnant you just got to go back to being fit and then you know it'll all work out speaking of which uh, I got some sad news Um, love of my life Sadly, uh, Mackenzie Bezos has got remarried. Happened about a month ago. I didn't want to talk about it at the time because I was still a little bit shooken up about it. I really thought we were going to spend our lives together spending Jeff's money. So it's upsetting to me. I'm, I'm taking the steps that I have to, to move on. I also feel like I was really close because the dude, she, she's got a thing for bald dudes. There aren't too many. I, and let me just say this. If for some reason this whole marrying some 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 science teacher thing to help you just give away the money. Firstly, I think giving it all away is a mistake. Let, let's spend it together. Let's take nice vacations. You want to give some of the money to charity? I understand that. But that's supposed to be for us. You shouldn't be giving away all this money to charity. And listen, this guy looks like you want to get together. I will lick your gums. I just want to float that out there. OK, that's how serious I'm about having this relationship work. But you got to set targets. You know, I got my dream board. I had Mackenzie Benz- Bezos up on this thing. Now I got to take her down. I got to replace her with a new target, a new person that I think I will be able to build a life with, you know, really put something together that will be a meaningful existence that when I am on my deathbed and I'm looking back in my life, I go, well, that thing was well lived. And so I've got a new target, which is um, apparently, if you've ever had Little Debbie uh, oatmeal cream pies, which is my favorite current snack available at the gas station across the street. Here's what's so great about the Little Debbie oatmeal cream pie. Aside from the fact that it's delicious, it doesn't look like it's as deadly as the thing is. Like, there's probably more calories in there than, like, a pack of, like, devil dogs. But you just eat, like, you would never buy two packs of devil dogs. You would never do that. But you're not ever buying just one oatmeal cream pie. 
Anyways, turns out that little Debbie, she ain't that little anymore. She's like 76 with bad teeth, which means you only got to rail that thing for a couple years before you can be eating little Debbie oatmeal cream pies for life and having the fortune. You can get back some of that money from all the years you spent 50 cents at gas stations buying yourselves little Debbie oatmeal cream pies. So I've redone my dream board. I've got a new target, a new lady on the loose that I know has the income to support my lifestyle and has the cookie stash. So if anyone's got any leads for how I actually get myself in touch with um, the little Debbie lady herself, let me know. And as I talk about ways to make money, let's take a word from our newest sponsor. It's always nice to get sponsors on the podcast, keep the thing up and running, um, be able to have producers behind the scenes with the great intro songs, getting our videos up on YouTube, all that stuff really, it, it takes money. And um, I'm happy to have our newest sponsor. Let me just get copy up here. And they actually give me a music bed to go behind it. So, all right, here's a new copy. Um, are you sick of seeing your pregnant wife at home? Do you just hate that she's spending all day with morning sickness and not making money for the family, but also not doing household chores? Well, here at the U.S. Army, we're putting pregnant women back to work. And to make sure they're comfortable during their pregnancy, we've created special uniforms that lets everyone know just how pregnant they are. No more guessing workers if your coworkers are getting fat or pretending that their pregnancy is excuse for not working. Jobs for pregnant women include flying, combat, and falling over, having a miscarriage, and giving the medics something to practice on. Marines, the few, the proud, the pregnant. So if you know someone, let me just make sure I get this uh, website right. So if you know someone who's sitting at home pregnant, just go to bombthirdworldcountries.com. Again, that's bombthepoor.com. That's keepyemenhungry.org. Again, that's middle, obse- <laughs> middle East obsession.net and use promo code get this dumb bitch off the couch. So again, that's servetherich.com and promo code my wife's getting fat for 10% off. Okay, let's get back into it. And thank you to that organization for sponsoring the podcast, which brings us to Tucker Carlson. And uh, you can go into the part of the problem archive. We did a whole episode about it. He's talking about how the military is creating these uh, prego suits so that pregnant women can fly the flighter, fight, fighter jets or something along those lines. It might have just turned out to be a conversation about outfits. But if that's the case, just educate us. I didn't realize how important outfits were to the Marines. I don't know these things, you know, just give us a little bit of education. Here's the one thing I want to point out from that conversation. Change is good, but when change is good, you should probably provide a reason for why you want to initiate that change. And if the question is, you go, hey, I'm going to initiate this change, and someone goes, okay, well, why that is that change a good idea? The answer shouldn't be, how dare you call attention to this? If you got a change and the change is a good idea, shouldn't you be excited about it? Shouldn't you just be able to explain it to us? So if your new idea is that we're going to, you know... <laughs> Make sure that women can still fly planes even if they're pregnant. Just explain it to us. Or if it's just an out, an outfit wardrobe thing and you're just trying to make sure that people got the, the right um, lipstick for while they're serving in the military, just let us know that. It's not that big of a deal. And then here's what's great about this show is that I'm now at the point where I have enough listeners where um, sometimes I'm talking about these topics and there's people that actually – know this stuff and they hit me up and sometimes I'm able to get them on the show. Uh, sadly, the people that hit me up that are actually working in the military, you know, they wanted to give me like the inside scoop. They didn't feel comfortable coming on the show, but they said that the actual situation is worse than what we were hearing about. It's not just the flight suits, but apparently their coworkers um, need to start bringing in cocoa butter and applying it to like the sides of the stomach. And if there's any morning sickness going on, they actually have to lie on the floor and let the pregnant women sit on their faces. Um, and it's not just that, it's worse than that. And I, I'm getting this directly from people in the military. Um, but they also let the pregnant women sit in the planes and then just like kind of pretend like they're flying. Um, so you get like a squad that stands around the plane. You know, you got a fan guy, you've got a guy, it's like a movie set where he's running past the plane with images. And apparently it's, um, the, the military, they're moving on from this idea of completing missions. Now they're just going to try and get more people into the military who they can just pretend like they're working. So, you know, like all the people that we used to um, say we needed to protect, it was like women, children, cripples, old people. We're just going to put them in uniforms now, and we're going to give them pretend jobs in the military so that way everybody um, can uh, can feel important. And that's really what it's all about at the end of the day. It doesn't matter what it costs as long as some random individuals can feel like they are 
um, important and making contributions. Uh, and the one thing I was thinking about, what do I know about uh, pregnancy? I can say something about eating sandwiches and getting fat, though. I've had uh, a half a bubble gut myself. I've experienced the first three months of uh, what pregnancy might look like. <laughs> uh, but what a great move. If I was a lady and I could get away with you just got to like when you get into your first job, you get pregnant within the first three months. And then you just every single year you get pregnant again. And then it's 10 years later, you've barely even worked at this company. Every single year they weren't able to fire you because uh, you were pregnant with a kid. And then after 10 years you go, hey, listen, how come I haven't been promoted here? Is this, is this because I'm a lady? Do you discriminate against pregnancies? Um, now I'm not saying that companies shouldn't have to pay for your pregnancy. I'm not saying women shouldn't get pregnant. I'm just saying if you're looking for a good, uh, a good groove in this system for how to continuously have employment without ever having to really work. You just got to keep cranking out those kids every single year. You crank out a fresh one. They can't, they can't fire you. You get to keep all those benefits. And then every year when you're not promoted because you haven't really worked there and you don't really know how to do the job, you get to pretend like it's discriminatory and that they got something against women. It's a great, it's a great system. I mean, you're going to have to deal with 10 kids, but maybe you can just give them up for adoption anyways. You can sell them on the other end. So <laughs> really the only thing you got to deal with, you got to be one of these women who can really rebound from, like some people I think they get like the morning sickness thing, like, you know, real bad, or I don't know that I, I can't, I've never gone through pregnant. I think maybe it gets easier. Maybe you get really good at it. Maybe you get really good at like turning that thing around, like at exactly at the 11 month mark after the last one, you get re-pregnant, you get that uterus down to a science, fill it up crank them out, sell them to a rich person, collect the benefits on your job side and sell the kid on the back side. I like all of that. Uh, all right. Next thing I wanted to talk about is I feel like in life, I'm not very good at making decisions. I wish I was better at it. I'll have dumb emails come in for me at work and like, I'll sweat it for, I'm, I, I get nervous. I don't want to respond to email. I don't want to make a decision. Sometimes lunch, sometimes even lunch. I can drive around for a half hour trying to figure out what the hell I'm going to eat for lunch. I'm not good at making decisions. But that's also why I try and avoid jobs or positions where you have to make big decisions because I know that about my personality. Now, I do think that if you're in government and you go, hey, listen, I want to be in charge here. I want to be the person to make some decisions. Then you have to actually do it. You have to actually go, hey, there's some tough decisions that need to be made here and I'm going to do it. And I think that to me, when I look at what's going on in immigration, is it seems like they're just letting the mess fester. They don't want to make tough decisions. They don't want to do it. So they just don't. And, you know, I, I don't know. It, they just let, let, let it balloon. Let it be like the debt. Let, let either people sneak in or not sneak in. Let's not figure out who we want to have in this country or don't want. And I'm not even saying... I want to make these decisions, but I do think that if you're going to be in charge, it's one of the things that you should probably sit down and have a conversation about. And you can't pretend like nobody cares about it because it was one of the platforms that Donald Trump won on. And I guess, yes, that's true. He's no longer the president and he did lose this go around. But I don't think you can pretend like this is an issue that just nobody cares about whatsoever. I do think it's something that we can safely say that we do care about and should be addressed. So I want to read a little quote that I just saw from Biden. And here is the quote. We will also not waver in our values and our principles as a nation. Our goal is a safe, legal, and orderly immigration system that is based on our bedrock priorities to keep our borders secure, address the plight of children as the law requires, and enables families to be together and just to be full of shit. <laughs> That's the problem. It's that it, I, I find this happens all the time with government programs is that they'll create like, I, I don't know, let's say people start losing their homes. So they'll create some sort of a government program where, you know, they're going to help the people who lost their jobs pay for their homes. But there isn't actually enough money for the government to pay for everyone to stay in their homes. So really, a lot of people apply for it. You know, maybe 10 people in the whole country get the program. And then they just speak to the program. And they go, we understand that there's hard financial conditions out there. So we've created this housing program. And these, uh, and we've, we've paid for these people's homes. And then really, it's like 20,000 people applied for this. 
you know, 19,990 did not get accepted and they're all sitting at home going bullshit. And then the only thing the president talks about is, well, look at these 10 people that we're able to help. And he gets to pretend like that is the morality of the country that we help everybody in need all the time. And you just don't mention the 19,990 people that were shafted. So we can all probably expect for Biden to continue to claim that everything is fine on the Southern front. Everything's taken care of. Every kid coming over the border is being provided for. And yet there will be no change in voting demographics whatsoever. Every single person that comes in will be a contributor to the country and they will no, no, in no way affect the culture or the vote of people in Southern states who might not have agreed to the perfect system. So it's all perfect and worked out and there's really nothing that needs to be addressed whatsoever. You can expect that that will be the coverage of this um, moving forward. All right. In other news, this was an article from The Hill um, about Kavanaugh. Remember Kavanaugh? And uh, he showed up with his calendar to say, hey, look, there's no rape in my calendar. I've got a perfect system here. If there was rape, I would have put it in my calendar. I keep a calendar of every single day of my life and there's no rape in here. So you can look through it. 40 years, not one single self-recorded incident of rape. And so now he's, uh, you know, Supreme Court justice, and they are claiming that the FBI, they didn't actually run an investigation on this. They claimed that they were going to look into the, uh, you know, the, 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 the character in question. They were going to look into the events. They were going to see if, in fact, he did rape. Um, was it full-on rape or just whipping your dick out? I, I, don't, I don't quite remember what the claim was. I think it was a full-on, oh, no, I think it was taking the dick out, and then it was like a conspiracy to commit rape where he pulled his dick out, people held her down, and then I think they moved on from it. I think that's the way it was. I can't remember, um, I can't remember everything that happens in the news, even on the interesting topics like rape. But anyways, so they're talking about that the FBI, they didn't do a full investigation. People were calling in. They had evidence. They had uh, other claims to make, and then they were just throwing them out on the backside. It would be very interesting if this turned into a larger news story. I don't think it will, but it would be interesting to see if the Democrats try and revisit that one and to see if they can get Brett taken down from the court. Maybe they can get all the Supreme Court justices off the court. I mean, the conservative ones, um, including the new lady. <laughs> but, you know, they were talking about, hey, we're not going to pack the court, but they never said that they're, we're not going to revisit, you know, fake sexual assault claims or revisit sexual assault claims to see if we can get the justices that are there uh, taken off, which also... I want to point out as Durham, the guy who is investigating the origins of the Russia collusion story has left the AG department. And I do not believe that that investigation is going to continue with him having left, but who knows? Uh, interesting thing in government where it's like whoever can control these organizations gets to investigate their enemies and there is no truth. There is no justice, but you all know that you already listened to the podcast and why not take a moment to plug one of our um, actual sponsors, and that is Sheath Underwear, which, by the way, if you're a pregnant lady, there's a great band. That is a supportive band. I feel like usually I wear this thing underneath the waistline, but if you're a pregnant lady, I feel like you could probably pull that up over your waist. It would rest there comfortably, and you could probably look like you weren't as pregnant. I don't think I don't think you want like an elastic band pressing in on your stomach, nor do I think that's good marketing for sheath. And why wouldn't I tell you about the core feature of the sheath underwear, which is what makes it so incredible. It's the most supportive underwear for your junk. And we could all use a little bit of support in our life right now. It's got a dual support system. Actually, you know what? I'm going to go bigger than that. It's got a tri support system. What are the three levels of support that sheath will bring to your, to your under edge? Uh, one, it's got great, comfortable, elastic material that even if you want to wear this just as regular boxer briefs, you can wear it as regular boxer briefs. You're going to feel fully supported. Now, let's say you want to take the plunge into two levels of support for your junk. They've got a shelf for your nuts. You know, a single other pair of underwear that gives you a resting area for your nuts. So they're not just hanging down. You're not just leaving them from gravity to pull to the floor. Tell me another pair of underwear that very specifically has a little bit of a ledge that you can just tuck your nuts into so you can comfortably, you can run for days, for miles. You don't have to worry about these things just swinging around. And now I know you might be thinking, 
if I've got a nice area to tuck my nuts into, well, what's going to happen to my penis? What is it just going to be resting over my nuts? Is it going to all be like shoved into the exact same area? And the answer, my friend, is of course not. The sheath people, they are geniuses. They sat down and they did their research. They found out how can someone's nuts be best supported by undergarments. And the answer is it's a shelf for your nuts and it's a hole for your wiener. And so that's what they did. They've got the sheath hole. So you put your wiener into the sheath hole. You put your nuts on the shelf. I don't know if a shelf is the best description for it. It's like a little pouch. It's like a nice little pouch. The rest of the stuff, you know, it, uh, it's nice, good underwear. It wicks away the moisture. Next thing you know, you could go run for, uh, for days without a chafing problem and without your dick flopping around. So go check it out. Sheath underwear. Use promo code RYM. You are going to get 10% off. Here is the next article I want to read to you people. NPR. U.S. intelligence agencies warm of heightened domestic extremism threat. A new report from the U.S. intelligence community warns of future unspecified violence committed by domestic extremists who have been emboldened by the siege of the U.S. Capitol and conspiracy theories about the 2020 election and coronavirus pandemic. First is future unspecified sounds even scarier. Like if you had anything that was specific, it might not be that scary. Like if you just said rioting or you just said like uh, threat on government buildings, I guess at least it's quantified, but future unspecified is firstly, both sound super scary. And then the other part that's funny about that is that how you both know that something's going to happen. Like we're really sure something's happening. It's going to be in a date that we can't specify. It's just going to be in the future and the actual threat is unspecified, but we're certain that it's going to happen. That's quite a line to talk about here. All right. So let's read a little bit more from the article here. President Biden commissioned a threat assessment shortly after taking office. An unclassified summary of the findings issued by the U.S. Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the Department of Justice, and the Department of Homeland Security was released Wednesday. The full classified report was sent to the White House and Congress. It concludes that racially and ethnically motivated extremists such as white supremacists and those tied to violent militias are considered the most lethal threats. Lone offenders or smaller swells, cells of extremists are more likely than organizations to carry out attacks and are proving harder for law enforcement to track. And this is exactly what I was talking about before with the FBI investigating Kavanaugh. Whoever's in charge gets to uh, assign these agencies. And you know what? Maybe you could say that Donald Trump didn't have enough power, wrangle enough power in government to effectively use these organizations to carry out his agenda. Or maybe that's exactly evidence that what I'm saying right now isn't true because Donald Trump wasn't able to do that. But I think the more traditional people who are a part of the system uh, are able to basically go, hey, can you give me a report on this? And then they can just do it. It's just, hey, I'm trying to create this narrative that um, there's this extreme threat of domestic terrorism. And that's why we're going to need to censor certain individuals and groups. And that's going to be something that we are going to continue be, to be able to point to as being the threat of Donald Trump is that because of the words of Donald Trump, we now have a more violent country. We've got a domestic terrorism threat. And so can you please get me a report that basically says exactly the propaganda that we've been trying to be spinning. Because if it comes from the intelligence community, then we can talk about how it's the intelligence community that conveniently seems to write an article of the exact propaganda that we've been trying to work with. Next in the article, the threat of militia extremist groups increased last year and is expected to continue to heighten throughout 2021, the report said. That's because of socio-political factors motivating these groups, such as narratives of fraud in the recent general election, the emboldening impact of the violent breach of the U.S. Capitol. I want to reread that last part, the emboldening impact of the violent breach of the U.S. Capitol. I don't remember that that working out that well. Are there really people who watch that? Firstly, let's remember the fact that they kind of walked in and walked out. I don't know that it was, I, I mean, there was violence used in terms of the breach. But now with all these people getting in trouble for it and the fact that government wasn't actually overturned, nothing came of it other than bad press. Are people actually emboldened by this? Are there more groups sitting around now who said, hey, we got away with that one and that one worked out really good. So we got to double and triple our efforts. We, we got to do more walk through government buildings. 
that one really played out well in the media. You look at how many more people want to support our cause and, hey, we did it. We, we overtook that government building and then, you know, Congress got so spooked, they said, you know what, we were wrong to try and unseat Donald Trump, the guy who was really elected before we instigated all this fraud. So you know what? That's what emboldening would look like is, hey, that thing worked out so well, we're going to do more of it. Is there a single person that that's like the, the Charlottesville thing? I, I think... Uh, where do we see it? Chris Cantwell at some point was talking about that we've got to kind of sit in the sit in the shadows a little bit more. I I believe I don't remember where I saw that. It must have been some some random YouTube thing where he said that thing really didn't work out well. So to pretend like they were like those people were emboldened by what happened in Charlottesville, that's why they've done so many rallies since then. That's why we've seen so much more um violent or no, we've just seen so many more hate groups getting together on weekends. That's like the new weekend activity. You know, some people go to brunch and uh, hate groups are getting together so that they can parade in the street. Not happening because they weren't emboldened by the event. Same as there is not a single militia group that saw what happened at the Capitol building who's thinking, hey, we got to do more of that. That worked out really, really well. All right, let's continue. New article. This is USA Today. Capitol riot insurrection arrest near 300... Um, let me retake that. It's a USA Today story about Capitol riot insurrection arrest nears 300. So in the two months since an angry God mob forced its way into the U.S. Capitol, agents in all but one of the FBI's 56 field offices have been drafted to track down those who participated in the deadly insurrection. Investigators who typically work cases involving the trafficking of drugs, child pornography, and sex have taken calls from rioters, angry ex-wives, and former girlfriends, and employees turned tipsters. In other words, just... Everyone in your life who you've ever annoyed is calling you up and like that, that, that sandwich guy you're not tipping well enough, everyone's calling up. They've mined tens of thousands of photos and videos. They follow trails, rioters left on social media bragging about being inside the Capitol, like the Florida man, Florida man touting a rostrum or the New Hampshire man who snapped a selfie with a pilfered bottle of wine. And they've arrested almost 300, but as many as 500 remain at large of the 800 who Capitol Police believe entered um, the building. So the first thing I would like to point out is that, do you remember when we were covering all of the riots that were taking place over the summer, all the things that were Tifa were doing, and I said that if they wanted to, they could put an end to this. If they wanted to, look at how many security cameras exist. Look at how much they track every single, every single person's license plate. Everywhere you go in this country, there's nowhere they don't know where you're going. Let's be honest. Between whatever the NSA has on our phones, which they don't tell us about, just off of tolls. If you, if you gave me three intelligence officers, I could figure out what fucking toll footage of license plates were. And, and then when people pull into towns with all the cameras, it's really, it's probably not that hard to reverse engineer who everybody in a city is and where they came from and how they got there. The plane tickets. I, I'm just, I've got no investigative experience whatsoever. And I don't like doing data work at all. But if you gave me a couple nerdy kids who were willing to work through it, I promise you I could figure out how to track this stuff back. And then if you start looking at people's posts, you start looking at all the foot, it is not that hard. And what is becoming clear is um, that I was right. It only takes six months for the news to basically just admit that I that, that, might, that might as well just become a new newspaper story called Rob is Right. It could be like its own publication. And it's like the six month look back on um, previous news articles and telling you about how I was actually right. So in this case, they're actually doing the look back and they're rounding everybody up, which is uh, proof of the fact that they always can and could do this. All right, here's another little piece from the article I would like to read for, for you. This is, they range in age from 18 to 70, but average around 40. They're mostly men and almost all white. Many have bankruptcies or other financial troubles in their lives. And I think that that is the important thing that nobody talks about is that if there is a good economy, people are happy and then they don't do violent and terrible shit. It all comes down to money. Like all of the stuff that people are or that like they're trying to pretend that the division is over other things or that some groups of people don't like other groups of people. No one cares. 
I, I'm telling you, I spent time in, in, in Israel. I've t- t- talked to scatter, scattered Palestinians. I talked to, they don't care. Most Israelis, they'd rather live in America. They don't fucking care. People just want money. People just want money. They want to be able to get married. They want to be able to live a good life. And if people can do that, they don't turn into people that storm Capitol buildings. They don't turn into race. Nobody cares about anything other than money. The entire construct that like any of these other things are actually a concern of people. It's not true. If you have money, you'll figure out how to get along with people because then you've got something to lose. You, you got you got your wife, you got your house, you got kids, and you're just like, hey, I'm not going to go do dumb shit because I'm living a pretty good life here. So I can just figure out how to get along with other groups of people because my life is pretty good. It's when your life is terrible that suddenly the risk of walking into a Capitol building, it's like, you know, you're firstly, you're mad. And so you're looking for someone to blame. You're looking for people to take action against, or you're looking for other groups of people that you can scapegoat. You're looking for anything, which I'm not saying is right. But what I am saying is if we lived in an environment where there was actual economic opportunity, all this finger pointing and all this fear of other groups of people, it just doesn't exist. You want to figure out how that you can keep the country from going down some, you know, racist road of hating other groups of people or even pointing to the border and saying, hey, these groups of people that are coming, it's all money. That's all in, nobody talks about it. That's all that anyone cares about is just being able to live a decent, good life. All right. Now here is another article. Oh no, this might be from the same article, but it's creepy. What tools are being used to track people down? Court documents got into great detail about the FBI's work to verify tips, match photos with driver's license pictures, and track the suspect's trips to and from the D.C. area on license plate toll readers. In photos and videos, they study moles, scars, and tattoos in every visible body location. Agents interviewed officers with the Capitol Police and Metropolitan Police Departments listening to the harrowing stories being pummeled, sprayed with fire extinguishers, packed with pepper spray, insulted and overrun. They've watched hours of the evidence on the footage from security and body cameras. Agents also are using higher level technologies. Okay, I'm going to reread that because this is about to get creepy. And this is also the only technology that they're telling us about. Agents also are using higher level technologies. In one filing last week, the FBI revealed it has a list of every cell phone or device authorized to be in the Capitol building and is using it to identify owners of cell phones that pinge into the Capitol that day who aren't on the list. And I just want to point out that that is being defined as a higher level technology and that just one of the higher level technologies that they're actually telling us about. They know where we are all the time. Here's the last news story I want to tell you guys about, which is about the uh, hookers being murdered out in Atlanta, Um, which, of course, they're not talking about how they are um, prostitutes. What they're talking about is the um, violence that is um, taking place in this country against Asians, which uh, apparently there is a little bit of a increase in that. I believe that the increase might be other minority groups acting out against other minority groups. Any information that you guys have on this, uh, you know, the information that you guys sent me in terms of what was really going on with the pregnant ladies was helpful. So just shoot me an email. You know, I, I, as much budget as I'm bringing in from these sponsors, we could still use more budget for a research team so that, you know, maybe at one point I could become like a Biden type guy. I can just sit down and mumble my way through a teleprompter and I can have the most important job in the entire world because I've got the Yo Kratom backing paying my research team so that I can just sit there and read the teleprompter. I would love to just sit down and read a teleprompter. Are you kidding me? Just take naps. Um, sniff some kids, sit in a chair, live that good Biden lifestyle. I'd be all for it. Which speaking of which I might as well plug Yo Kratom right now. Yo Kratom, $60 kilos. Where else are you getting a kilo of anything? I don't, there's no kilo store. You know, where in the world can you go, you go walk into a store tomorrow and say, Hey, I'm looking for a kilo of something. You're, you're going to get the officer far of a treatment. He was looking for a liter of cola, but not the people of Yo Kratom. If you want to pick up a kilo, you want to feel like a boss and buy a kilo of something. You got to go to YoKratom.com, home of the $60 kilo, get yourself some Kratom, enjoy it in the evening times. It's uh, a nice way to relax if uh, you're into that kind of thing. But if you're not into that kind of thing, you don't even need to try it and only try it if you're over the age of 21. Uh, but Point being, Kilo. It's fun to pick up a Kilo, have it shipped right to your door. YoKratom.com, home of the $6 Kilo. Let's move on. So, Atlanta. 
you got hookers. They're being killed. You got this Christian kid, and uh, you know he. I you know what I I want to I want to try and help out the youth of this country. Maybe I can start like a masturbations group, and I'll keep, teach kid, young kids how to. By young kids, I mean like over the age of eighteen, but like over the age of eighteen kids that aren't able to get laid with a religious background, um, so they didn't really date, and they're confused about. Their relationship with the Lord, I'm, I'm sympathetic towards this, and I'd like to teach these kids how to masturbate. I can teach them about porn. I can teach them about lube. I can teach them about regulating the shame from having masturbated with um, Little Debbie oatmeal cream pies. I can tell them about turning 33, still being signal, and then fantasizing that you can redeem this entire lifestyle by going ahead and marrying the oatmeal cream pie lady. The point is, I, I don't know if um, maybe maybe the Boy Scouts would be the right group for me to work with in terms of opening this new division of the Boy Scouts where I help teach young men how to masturbate. Um, but apparently there's an issue where some young men haven't learned how to do that, and then they start spending their entire money on uh, hookers, and then they're so addicted to the hookers that they realize, I better go start murdering these people so that I can help prevent other people from being so tempted by these people. And then the news comes along and tries to say that he was he was so addicted to this stuff that, that that's why it was it was so good, it was racist of him. I don't know. You kind of get lost in the logic on that one. I definitely put that joke better in uh, in tweet form, which is why you should follow me. Go to Robbie the Fire. You can see the way I wrote that because it definitely came out better than the way I just stated it. But anyways, this guy goes out there, and first thing that's interesting is there's no conversation about the fact that um, being a hooker is illegal in this country. I'm not saying that you should murder hookers, but I do think, like, imagine if uh, somebody decided to do vigilante justice and uh, murder the drug dealers on the corner of the street, and then the newspaper just said, hey, listen, this person was racist against, um, you know, I don't know, let's say that they were Mexicans. They were Mexican drug dealers or black drug dealers, whatever minority group, Asian drug dealers. This guy was racist against Asians, and there was no conversation about the fact. Now, I agree with you. I, I don't know that drug dealers should be illegal or that hookering should be illegal, but at the moment it is not my decision. I'm not the person that did that. And it's funny just to pretend like these people are, you know, operating a, like a yawn, like a, a knitting store. It's like, these are just perfectly good citizens. And it's not like the cops are looking the other way on something that is illegal because these places are obviously places to get hookers. That's all it is. I mean, go look at the pictures of it. Does not look like you're upscale place for, you know, getting a massage because your lower back's in pain. This is a place for getting a handy. And then they're also trying to say that, like, yeah, I guess it's the Asians being, is it, is it that Asians are being fetishized or that more of them are, for whatever reason, ending up, like, it, it, ask your average male who goes to this place, if you show up and there's some hot 20-year-old white chick, are you, like, furious that it's not, is this really just a Asian Asians being fetish side, like, I don't know, they're really trying to paint this as being um, an example that because of Donald Trump's words about the coronavirus, there are men out there who are now just looking to be violent towards Asians, uh, and that this is a clear example of the bigotry that is, it's in the current of our country. There's constant, it's in everybody at every time. There's a little bit of bigotry. And if a world leader just says the right words, people will feel inclined to show up and go murder some hookers. And so that's all the coverage. The coverage is just about how, um, and this is like cross board. This is every single newspaper is just talking about how this person decided to be violent towards Asians. And then here is the statement from the Cherokee sheriff investigators interviewed Long in Crisp County, followed his capture last night. Long confessed to the shootings in Cherokee County in Atlanta. Long told investigators the crimes were not racially motivated. Long told investigators that he blames the massive parlors for providing an outlet for his addiction to sex. But we never listen to confessions of killers. I mean, that, you can't even use that in court. If someone confesses to a crime or what their motives are, we throw that right out. Even with a full confession about what it is that a person has done, we don't listen to him. We throw that out. It's not admissible to court. And then we have to figure out other evidence to prove that they were actually guilty of the crime. The other thing to be aware of is that in the shooting, six out of the eight were um, Asian Americans. Then they still look at that as solid proof of the fact that he was specifically. And now, why do I, why do I call attention to this? The reason 
I think I call attention to this is that we've got problems in this country. We've got things that we should fix. And like I said, I think it all actually just comes down to money and economic opportunities. And so why don't we focus on things that benefit everybody instead of focusing on protected class, not protected class, creating a, a thing for domestic terrorists so that, I, I mean, not that I think this is going to happen, but in the most extreme thing, you know, the same way they were calling taking terrorists and putting them in Gitmo without trials and keeping them for really long times without trials. Uh, we got to, I guess, right away say this looks like a bad direction. This doesn't look like a good way to approach it is that to label everything as being some racially motivated crime, even when it's not to create this environment where we're in, where we're pretending like every single group is going after all the other, like that's just going to disturb, create more panic. It creates more of people feeling like, oh shit, I better stick to more. Like, I don't even really know where I'm going with this. Let's just do a, a good PSA. If you're out there, don't, don't murder Asian hookers. Um, really, you probably shouldn't murder anybody or see any hookers. But if you're really addicted to Asian hookers, um, don't don't murder them. Uh, and if you do, you just know that you're probably not going to actually rid the world of prostitution, but you probably will contribute to um, them potentially getting uh, domestic terrorism law. And also, if you're out there and you're over the age of 18 and um, you need help with masturbation, just hit me up, robsnewsroom at gmail.com. I really want to live in a world where, you know, no men feel like they need to kill Asian hookers. Uh, and so I'm, I, I, you got to do your part. You know, it, it's easy to talk. It's easy to look at these news stories every week and just criticize what everyone else is doing. And that's why I'd like at least to step forward and see what I can do to help make a difference. And especially once I take down Little Debbie from the Little Debbie Oatmeal Cream Pies, um, I'm going to have the financial resources to open up these male masturbation centers where we teach 18 year olds how to keep their tubes dry so that they aren't, you know, murdering Asian hookers. That's all you can do. At the end of the day, I've rambled a bunch and I, I can't have solutions to every one of the world's problems. Um, but I do feel like these male masturbation centers that I'm going to open up are really going to, and I've, I've tips. I've been, I've been at it for a while. So I got some tips. I can help these, these younger kids avoid some chafing. I can help that, right? We can open up like a, a porn library where we can really steer people. We can even have like, you know, a librarian that helps people go into the right direction. They continuously find new areas of interest that they never have to go down, um, and support their local brothels and then end up so addicted that they're murdering people. So, and you guys can contribute. You guys can get involved as well. Maybe uh, amongst us, what we can start doing is getting together to masturbate so that everyone can share tips and we can really, because most people don't masturbate with other people. So there's really only so much knowledge that you have. And really, no one's really doing that much like research on it. It's something one of your friends tells you, hey, you know, if you're rubbing this thing, some white stuff's going to come out. It's going to feel good. They tell you that when you're 13 and then you experiment or whatever age, maybe for you is eight, maybe for you is seven. We all got started at different times. Most of us are pretty good at it by now. Um, we've put in the time, but we haven't shared notes. So maybe what we can do first is we can create like a male masturbation council where we get together. We all kind of share our tips. Um, we share lubes. We share bad stories. You know, we just get all the information out on the table. Maybe like the AA, you know, we can have a book, you know, where with, it's like a resources. Um, it's like best tips. And then from there, once we've kind of compiled all the known information, you know, what all of us can contribute to this cause, then we can open up the centers and start getting together with um, young men and helping them out on, uh, on their life's journey. All right, that's it.